Well, good morning. This is actually a better turnout than I ever would have imagined for a Friday in New Orleans after a week. You guys are terrific. I also can't really believe it's been 1990 since Aslo has been here to New Orleans, so welcome back. Well, the introduction said most about me that I was going to tell you, so I'll kind of plunge into my talk. <clears throat> Professor Talkner, you know, made you know, a very clear you know, case about you know, the nature of domesticating rivers and the costs that come with them. And I'm going to tell you, in my, from, at least from the perspective that I've gathered, that the domestication of waterways and other natural resources is anything but a coincidence. But in particular with waterways, they rarely stay tamed. These are dynamic systems that tend to force changes in those who try to manage them, if they try to manage them too strictly. And to think about water as a resource that we live with and manage, we have to think about it historically. And traditionally, the connection between water and civilization was fairly clear, which was live near water. For the most part, if you look around, most people have a preference for having water. I, I don't get it, but it's the way it is. And, in fact, taming nature was almost a working definition of civilization. It's how could you carve out some place where nature didn't run your life, but you ran it a bit more. Now, over the last 150 years or so, we've seen an evolution where the relationship between human societies and nature has become less one of taming and one more of commanding. Indeed, if you look at where we've put cities and major urban developments and industrial processes, it's no longer just a question of live near water. It's increasingly live where you want and make the water appear. How else can you explain Los Angeles, California, you know, much of what you're now seeing in the urbanization of the Middle East, Las Vegas, Nevada, any number of places. And even places in the United States that once had a pretty robust supply of water, like Atlanta, Georgia, find that they're at the end of their water rope. How do you continue to grow if your water supply won't grow with you? Well, this is the realm that you would normally think would be informed water management. We bring people together who have multiple disciplines. We try to understand the fundamental science, if you will, of these natural resources and the systems that depend upon them. But that's not the way we've traditionally done it. For the most part, we've managed water as either a utility or as an adjunct to property ownership. The legal regimes that dominate water management around the globe are essentially one of two. One is riparianism, which is the water is, is public, but it's used as an amenity for the properties alongside the water. The other is the doctrine of prior appropriation, which is largely for you know, communities and areas that developed after the places near the water were filled up, and it is Whoever can get the water first and put it to use, it's yours to use. The water may technically still be a public resource, but it has been essentially turned over as a matter of policy and then codified in law to encourage development. It's a way that you encourage people to make deserts bloom, which is a fine thing if you actually have a sustainable amount of water. It's not such a fine thing if you don't. And it's one of the things that we're finding in this country with our Colorado River is they got the fundamental water budgets wrong. It doesn't mean that they have to move, but it does mean they have to revisit how they plan to live. Groundwater is a complete mystery for most of our experience. In fact, legally, the traditions that the United States borrowed from England is that it was unknowable. And since it was unknowable, what, how, can this, how can you have public management? Who can see beneath the earth? Who knows what it is? 
That's still the law in some places, even in the United States. If you live in Texas, that's fundamental to your law. And some states, some nations, take very different approaches to uncertainty. Some, when you're approached with something unknowable like groundwater, is to be cautious. If we don't know, let's be wary, move slowly, try to learn. Other places say it's unknowable, so we should encourage people to make whatever use of it they can. That will certainly be better than doing you know, management by misinformation. And technically, we didn't really have the capacity to move vast amounts of groundwater until the 1930s. So the legal doctrines that have been generated really over you know, centuries were trumped by technology the technology could, that could, in fact, make water appear. You couldn't really have a Las Vegas if you didn't have groundwater pumping. You couldn't have most of the major developments we have if you didn't have the, the kinds of technology that can move water vast difference, distances or even today to desalinate water on a vast scale. The other tradition that permeated traditional water management was that nature was an enemy. It was to be conquered and, the, and that the definition of waste, and this is an important thing to know, because most people when we talk about wasting water, it's, oh, turn off the tap, you don't need to use that much water. It's not the, oh, that's not the traditional definition. The traditional definition was an underutilized or unutilized natural resource which explains why you have series of dams on many rivers around the world that prevent those waters from ever reaching the sea. It's not an accident. It was policy, policy which then became law. Laws that don't change just because we change. And I think that's one of the things I think is vital to understand and that's why, if you will, the square pegs round hole analogy came to mind is that we are now working in a world where water is very different. These systems may have worked well when, or well enough, when there were fewer people, fewer users of water. The numbers of users were more limited. And where the water that was available was easy to get. That's no longer where we find ourselves increasingly. We find ourselves with depleted river supplies, reservoirs are low. We find ground, groundwater playing out. The largest aquifers in the United States, the Ogallala, is essentially a mine. It's a water mine. There's no reason not to use it, but there's no reason to expect the mine not to close one day, and it will. We're now seeing water becoming a bigger part of energy production. Oh, well, sure, we've always used water you know, in turbines and generators. We've used it in hydropower. But we've never really used it in the ways that we're using it now, essentially as we move into biofuels and into fracking, hydrologic fracking, where essentially water is being used as part of a process and often as a consumptive, as a consumptive use which is putting vast new demands on waters that were already under stress. Well, today the way we manage water is not exactly the way we did it before. We have learned. We've passed laws. We now do know that waste is something a bit more than an unutilized natural resource. We now know that water is a precious thing and that nature is good, not your enemy. But we also, I need to tell you, is that all those other things I mentioned before are still part of what we do today. Because knowing nature is good doesn't change the things that we did when we viewed nature as essentially a bad thing, something to be conquered. And the fundamental message I have here at this point is that water management decisions have been based largely on law, policy, theology, philosophy, but rarely science in the past because the science wasn't there or it wasn't available to the people making the decisions at the time. The doctrine of prior appropriation in the United States that I mentioned earlier was developed largely because you 
riparianism didn't work because you have to own the land next to the water to have riparian rights. And the people moving to California during the gold rush didn't have t deeds to anything, but they wanted to have some right to, m to pan for gold. So, and they didn't want them fighting with each other, so they said, whoever used the water first, you get that piece. It had nothing to do with long-term stewardship, but it did create long-term rights. And the science that, when it was used, tended to be the science of the moment or of a place. It was never science as a dynamic. It was not supposed to be a learning experience, an evolutionary experience. That's where law and policy parts company with the way we tend to learn in our individual lives. We learn, we grow, we change, laws don't, policies don't. And as, as we now move forward, we realize that that framework of laws and policies that we've created no longer answer the questions that we as societies need to answer about what do we need water for? What are the values of these ecosystems that in the past we may have taken for granted? We may have even just presumed that they would always be there. Now we know they won't. But what do we do? And we're, we have real, really two choices. And one, I think, is fundamentally you know, dependent upon the role that science can play. And that is, do we essentially round those pegs to make them fit? Do we make these things more reflective of what we know and who we are? Or do we just hammer harder? Because the default is that. Because right now, I can tell you, I've worked in legislatures, and I've worked in Congress, and I've worked for cl private clients. They are not in the business of learning the latest in science. They're not in the business normally of applying it. They're in the business of doing what they do. Which brings up the question, really, so what is, where are we headed and what is the role of science? And I just mentioned the doing what they do, and I'm going to use, just for convenience, this is not a perfect you know, dichotomy, but there are really two kinds of organizations that run most things in our lives. There are institutions that learn, and that's what we've created academe for. It's what Sir Francis Bacon had in mind when he really created the the modern university model in, in England hundreds of years ago. And it's the job of academe to learn, to teach, and to collect knowledge. But increasingly, especially over the last 150 years, we've created institutions that do. These are businesses, governmental entities, civic organizations, they can be churches. These are organizations that are in business to accomplish something sometimes based on faith, sometimes based on limited knowledge, but they have duties, missions, cultures, and constituencies that they respond to. Sure, they will consume new information. They will consume new science when it suits their purpose. But if the new information does not fit their purpose, you have to expect them to resist it. You, in fact, have to expect them to contest it. You shouldn't just, in fact, expect it. You should depend upon it. All you have to do is look at the, the nature of international debate, and particularly d domestic debate in the United States over climate change, to know that. It's anything but a dis discussion about science. It is very much a discussion about power economy and belief. Now, if we're in fact going to change, because the, the beauty is that things will in fact have to change, and knowledge can help shape them. But for institutions that learn, largely folks like yourself, to influence those folks that make these management decisions, you have to actually know how and when to engage. And fundamentally, I think you need to know Friedman's law of change. And Friedman is Milton Friedman, the famous economist, 
someone with whom I didn't agree on, with nearly everything, but he had one thing, in my view, exactly right. And it was that only a crisis, real or perceived, produces real change. And when that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around at the time. After Hurricane Katrina, here in New Orleans, the reaction was not, well, that was bad. Let's take 10 years and try to figure out what just happened and what we might do. Decisions had to be made in the moment. And most of the decisions that are pre-programmed are to go back to doing the things you were doing before because that's what people are set up to do. If you are not ready with your ideas in that moment, and those ideas are not really on the table where decisions are being made, they will, they, it's the same as not existing. You have a moment. You can influence it. Now, it's not normally the role of scientists to create those crises or even the solutions. But you do have the ability to inform those for, who that, for whom that is their job. And I'm also going to show some things here in a moment just to you know, give you an idea of why I think this is a time for this kind of change. Because water issues are coming to a head so broadly that the status quo can't hold there will be new approaches to water management and water stewardship. But we shouldn't assume that there'll be necessarily improvements. Only by effective engagement can we make that kind of assurance. Now, sorry. when you're dealing with any, any activists of any sort, and that can be a business leader, a politician, it can be a religious leader, it can be an environmental activist, it can be anything. Anyone who's in that realm of trying to influence and then make decisions about public management of resources, you need to know that they will be interested in science. But again, primarily in the science that works for them. They will use science to advance their aims. And there's nothing inherently good or bad about it. It just is, and you need to know it. Because they're not really out to learn or to teach. They're out to win, because that's the metric that defines success in their realm. I do think it's, it's vital, however, to take the time and to find the ways to engage them constructively that still preserves your independence. Now, when you do this, I want to be very clear with you, you will, should expect some heat. You should expect, first and foremost, people who don't like what you're saying to call you an egghead or, an un or someone who is not a realist. You'll be called an activist. They'll look through your record to find something that you did wrong before. I don't mean did wrong, got wrong. As though science is not the process of testing, proving, and disproving. And you'll hear that science is just another viewpoint. It's just like any other. No more or less valid. The thing that you need to understand when you hear those things is it's almost never about the merits of the science. It is about a way of distracting, in fact, from a discussion of the merits of the science. When you hear an attack like that, it is not fun. But it is evidence that you are probably doing something important. Indeed, back when I was with the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana, as noted, which for the most part, it was an organization that was devoted to making sure there was still a South Louisiana and Mississippi River to fight about 50 or 60 years from now. Very broad constituency, very broad you know, community representation. But even then, I knew that if I wasn't being called you know, a sellout or a socialist or an extremist by somebody at least once every year or so, I was probably not relevant. <laughs> 
The other thing you should expect, of course, if you expect heat, you should expect love. You should expect to be flattered. After all, someone's going to like what you say. And you're going to be hailed as one of the greatest scientists known to humankind. You'll be given awards, testimonials. You'll be asked to speak. You'll even sometimes be offered support for your work. As someone who lives on soft money, and I do, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, but you need to know that soft money is not normally offered because they just believe in your work. It's because it makes sense for them to do it from their perspective. Anyone who provides funding to any researcher to look into a question needs to know that by asking the question, they can control the outcome. It doesn't mean that the science is bad. It just means that they know, know that you're probably not going to be working on something else, that you are probably going to be very busy, and you're not going to be able to rep you know, even be engaged by anybody else's soft money. We saw this in a profound way after the Deepwater Horizon spill, which was a surprise to many of my colleagues in academia who hadn't had the chance to see a case at this level where one of the first things that occurred was teams of lawyers from every viewpoint went out and tried to put as many people with a PhD behind their name on essentially their payroll, either as a consultant or a researcher doing work with their funds. And again, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this. But on a larger scale, it can have a very great chilling effect on the availability of information to the public and to decision makers at large. I'm merely suggesting to you that when, when you are experiencing heat and love, know the true nature of them. They're both efforts by people who have a reason to care about some aspect of your work. But you can only be, only academia can be the, the guardians of the true value of that work. So when you're approached by friends, just as much as by you know, people who you perceive as hostile, know that you have to understand the terms that they're actually offering and make sure you negotiate well. Because again, it's not a coincidence that they're seeking, seeking your support. I think you also have to be, you have to expect to respond in this world. I think this, and I have a number of friends, some of who are on the IPCC, and it's very, been it's transformational to them. Work that they thought was going to be essentially rigorous, you know, collegial, important work suddenly was tr transformed into controversy and politics where they found themselves being the object of the story as opposed to the, you know, the trends in climate, the effects of climate change, and the possible causes of it. But if you're going to respond, make sure I, I would strongly urge you to respond as a scientist. I'll probably be thrown out of the bar if I tell you this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. When you, when you attack someone as an advocate, the thing that you're really hoping for is they rise to the bait and they respond in the same tone of the attack, which is personal. If I can say that scientist X is actually a secret radical, an intemperate response will convince people he may well be. However, if the response is really, it's not about me, it's about my science, and let's talk about my science, that's the last thing someone in the public policy arena wants to hear from someone they just hard. And I think it's vital that as you respond, always remember that you're, you know, we're, you're primarily educators. Educate through your response. Because you cannot reach those people making decisions if they don't know your work is there. They don't know the true meaning of the work, and they're not hearing it from the people doing the work. If they only hear it through filters, and that is the way most work reaches policymakers and decision makers,
that it's very hard for them to truly evaluate it. And I think you need to understand the difference between short-term and long-term policymaking. Most people who are elected to office, they have to make their decisions to appeal to people within two to four years. Things which, things which play out beyond that are very hard for them to put on their radar screen. Businesses increasingly work on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. If they don't hit their numbers, their stock goes down, people lose their jobs. I had a very revealing conversation several years ago with some senior officials with a major oil company. How I got invited to this meeting is still a mystery to me. But they had been doing extensive work in the Gulf of Mexico, and they had, in fact, taken decades to study it and bring it into play. And they were convinced that their investors would never let them have that kind of lead time again. It's not just the lead time to recover money, but it's the lead time to learn not just what you're doing, but the nature of the environments in which you are working. Now, at knowing that change is inevitable, even fundamental change, you know, is again, it doesn't mean that those changes will in fact be improvements. And I think you're, by visiting New Orleans, it's possible to realize that this is a, a great example. You're dealing with a river that has been channelized to the point that it's essentially starving the floodplain that it built. It's been carved up with canals for the exploration of oil, gas, sulfur, the harvesting of timber, the avoidance of enemy submarines. There are a whole lot of reasons, literally hundreds of years of reasons, some of them excellent reasons, that we still live with today. But amazingly, we were more honest about the nature and fate of that resource over a hundred years ago than we were 30 years ago. The levying of the Mississippi River, the draining of wetlands, which were officially deemed on many government maps as wastelands. It was policy to drain them, to put them to any productive use. It was more acknowledged in the 1890s or 1920s than it was in the 1970s. There's even proof. 1897 National Geographic had an article on the Mississippi River Delta which noted that the effective withholding by levees of the annual contributions of sediment and water was essentially going to sink the Delta. They said that the advantages would, would far outweigh the disadvantages to future generations from the subsidence of the Gulf Delta lands below the level of the sea and their gradual abandonment. 1928, Percy Viosca, a wildlife biologist here in Louisiana, wrote in the journal Ecology that reclamation and flood control as practiced in Louisiana have been more or less a failure, destroying valuable natural resources without producing the permanent compensating benefits originally desired. Reclamation experts and real estate promoters have been killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Yet, but by 1973, the Army Corps of Engineers doing an early study of the, vit the condition of the Mississippi River in this delta could only identify one place where coastal land loss was a problem, and that was on Grand Isle. How on earth we went from knowing that to failing to acknowledge it in an institutional capacity is revealing. I think it's in incredibly important for us to realize that it is our collective roles as people in academia and as citizens to make sure that doesn't happen. My first work down here was on Lake Pontchartrain, which is not a lake, it's an embayment, it's an estuary. It was considered dead a little over 20 years ago. There was a citizen-led effort to revitalize it, which has actually made significant progress, I'm pleased to say. But I'm always reminded of what one of the early board members, who was actually an official with our Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, noted at a meeting in which 
scientist after scientist came up explaining what was wrong with the lake. Oh, al algal blooms, you know, too much turbidity, too much pollution, too much this, too much that. Finally, Dr. Jerry Clark stopped the presentations and said, I just have a question. Are we here to save this lake or to document its demise? And I think that's a question that, you know, I've kind of carried with me through all the things that I've had the opportunity to work on, and I would suggest it's one that we should ask ourselves. When we're dealing with these aquatic systems, yes, it's important to understand them, but are we, in fact, documenting their demise, or are we facilitating their stewardship? It is possible to make those changes, and I'll leave you with one encouraging note, and that is, Several years ago, after the Clinton administration had made a commitment to restoring the Everglades, I got a meeting with then Secretary Bruce Babbitt, Secretary of Interior, and I asked him what it would take for the country to make a similar commitment to the Mississippi River Delta. I was refreshingly, you know, refreshed to hear that he said, well, I understand it's actually a bigger deal, far more ecologic value, bigger economic value, strategic value, but let me ask you something. Where's your governor? Where's your legislature? Where's your congressional delegation? We can't make this a bigger priority than you people make it yourselves. I was able to come back and get a meeting with our then governor. And I had learned one or two things over time, that it's, this is not a meeting a lawyer should have with a governor alone. So I invited two of the better scientists I knew who understood the river and the coast to, to join me. And the governor said, you know, I understand this is a problem. But what I really don't know is, is there anything we can do about it? Well, a lawyer could never have answered that question in a satisfactory fashion. I was able to turn to my friends and I said, what do you think? And they said, governor, we can never put it back. It will always be dynamic, but there are things we can do, especially if we start soon. That governor made a policy commitment to changing, saving this coast at that point. It was one of those moments that Milton Friedman had talked about. But it was also one that taught me a lesson, that is never to assume that people making decisions know enough to make the decisions that need to be made. And never assume they're reading your journals, going to your meetings, and talking to your friends. Make it your business, individually and professionally, to make that information available. Because I think, you know, when you talk about these systems, it's fundamentally a kind of a return to what I would call Bacon's Law of Sustainability. And again, it's Sir Francis Bacon, who noted that nature to be commanded must be obeyed. And I don't think we can obey it if we don't understand it. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I learned a lesson actually because I was also asking myself during the meeting what can we do actually as scientists to manage these important ec ecological environments? How can we do sustainable water management? And I think we got part of the answer, but of course there must be still a lot of scientific answers how to affect um, water management and water use to make it sustainable. So now I open the discussion and there is a question. The long, okay. Yeah. Could you comment on the differences between the short term and the long term? Because almost always when an action is going to be taken, there are certain identified individuals who are going to benefit. And very often if we say, but that's bad on the long term, that's a very vague group, maybe a generation or two down the line. So uh, how do you deal with that? Well, I'll start since I brought it up. I, I think in, in management terms, long term has become about five years. I wouldn't have said that, you know, 
not so long ago. But again, you have to think in terms, eco, you know, ecologic terms, ge geologic terms, very different from, from management terms. And we're, if we're going to be influencing management, you have to think in terms of their horizons. You may not understand them, you may not agree with them, but you need to, you have to be aware of them. And that is, to me, uh, where, where I would draw the line. Uh, well, for example, uh, if, if an area sells their water rights, they get money this year. Maybe they get money every year for a certain amount. But that commodity is going to become much more precious in the future. And they've limited their future. I would agree. Um, and, but I would also say that for people who are balancing budgets year to year, quarter to quarter, again, the, short, the, 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 the present and the short term are very clear to them. And I would say about, again, I wish it were otherwise, but five years is to me what I find the public policy, you know, long-term threshold to be. Uh, and it tends to get shorter rather than longer. I don't know how to work this. Okay. I guess it's on. This is for Mark Davis. Um, so I, I live, live in California where, as you probably know, water law is, is really complicated. It's a huge mess. And you talked about um, the possible need for, well, I think you implied the need for changing laws in uh, some of these overlapping and overlying uh, water rights uh, laws and so forth to make, uh, make it more flexible or allow for the uh, decrease in supply relative to demand. But is there any reasonable prospect, uh, given that these are rights enshrined in law, uh, for changing that law and making it more equitable, more flexible, or more usable? Um, the answer is yes. Um, uh, and first of all, you have to understand that water law is you know, sort of like saying religion. You know, it sounds all-encompassing and like it might be organized. It isn't. It's a combination of state, local, tribal, uh, private rights, public duties, all sorts of things. And each state in the United States has its own version. But what we're seeing, and this is actually just out of New Mexico in the last week, it has the same basic kinds of water laws that California has. So it has you know, it's basically a prior appropriation system for most rights. And they're finding that in droughts that they're having to actually go back and red redistribute water on an equitable, on an even basis instead of a priority basis. This is a challenge which is as fundamental as any, you know, this, is, this is a schism because that is essentially rejecting the fundamental basis of Western water law and replacing it with something based more on communal equity. I don't know how it'll turn out. But again, water rights that made sense for ranchers and miners and small towns, when you now have t cities of millions of people and you have a different type of you know, industry, you know, economic base, the changes are coming. We don't know what they'll be. And I would count on them being largely uninformed. I have I hear ecology mentioned by lawyers and water managers and legislators. I almost never hear hydrology. And in my 20 some odd years of doing this, I have never heard any of them mention limnology or oceanography. They need to. Are there more questions in the auditorium? Because from here, it's really hard to see. Um, are there some pressing questions? Otherwise, I would suggest to meet the plenary speakers. And I would like to thank both plenary speakers again. And, thanks. and I want to make a, a small reminder. Please take off your poster. There's still half an hour of time. And of course, I want to thank you for coming, especially this morning. I know it was tough to be here, but on the other hand, I hope you have learned quite a bit, and we may also change our own view on our own signs and how we communicate it to policymakers. Um,
I also want to thank all of you for this nice and exciting meeting. It was a pleasure actually to organize it. And again, many thanks to all the many helpers we had. And it was really a great pleasure. Thank you very much.